We invite you to view our videos on YouTube, available to you anytime, day or night from anywhere in the world. Click the subscribe button and smash that bell icon to be notified when we upload new content. Just follow the link on your screen, youtube.com forward slash Broad Street Presbyterian Church. Give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Friends, welcome to worship with the community of the Broad Street Presbyterian Church. We're glad you're worshiping with us on this second Sunday of Pentecost, also known as Trinity Sunday. We are sharing two scripture readings for today, one from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, and the other from 2 Corinthians, 13. Pastor Amy Miracle is preaching. Her sermon is called One Plus One Plus One Equals One. And now join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, how patient you are with your people. We run away and you seek us. We make foolish choices, and you teach us the better way. We hurt you and others, and instead of hurting us back, you forgive us. Help us, we pray. Help us reveal your glory and goodness in our living, that we will bear the imprint of Christ throughout the world. Amen. God's mercy is deep, and God's forgiveness never ends. You are included in that mercy and forgiveness. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. God has made peace with us in Christ, costly peace. Let us receive that peace for ourselves and let us share that peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. Amen. Good morning, kids. Welcome to Children's Time. This morning we call this Sunday, Trinity Sunday. Can you guys say Trinity? Nice. Sometimes it sounds like when we describe God, we're talking about three different gods, but really there's only one God. It's just the way we understand God sometimes sounds like three. 
The word Trinity means three because there are kind of three main ways we understand God in the Bible. God, Jesus, the Spirit. These are all one God, and yet the way we understand God, see God, feel God, know God, sometimes is best described as God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit. All are fully God and all are fully in our lives. And we are all connected to God through all of these. So while this may be a little confusing, don't worry about it too much. Just know that God is in your life, loving you, and you can connect with God in many ways. Amen. We have two readings this morning. First, from Matthew chapter 28. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but they doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Be restored, listen to my appeal, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, all the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is Trinity Sunday. It comes around once a year, and it's a day when we remember and think about and give thanks for the doctrine of the Trinity, this idea that God is one in three persons. So I'm gonna preach on that doctrine today and that, that should make you a little bit nervous because on several occasions I have admitted the fact that I really don't understand this doctrine. And it's why most years I skip over this Sunday, just pretend it's not there or I ask my colleague to preach. Because it, even just the phrase doctrine of the Trinity takes me back to a to an incident I would I would really rather forget. I, I was sitting at the end of a very long table and, and every other seat was filled by members of the committee on preparation for ministry of the Presbytery of New York City. It was my fourth and final meeting with this group. This was before I became a pastor and they were examining me to see if I was ready uh, to receive a call and ready to be ordained. And things were going pretty well. Um, and then someone asked me to say more about my understanding of the Trinity. Now, I, I do not remember what I said, but I will never forget how that group of people responded to my words. Um, they all began to lean forward in their seats and listen more intently, not because they were impressed with my answer, but because they sensed weakness. They all, all of a sudden, just, just all of them had follow-up questions to ask me. And, 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 and in that moment, I, I felt like the fox at the hunt. I felt like the puck at the hockey game. I, I felt like a fly in a room full of people with fly swatters. I was just starting to think about alternative careers when I remembered something that one of my professors had said in class. And I, so I said, the doctrine of the Trinity was a means by which early Christians tried to understand the fullness of God. Well, at that, everyone sat back in their seats, um, looking somewhat disappointed that I had given them a satisfactory answer. But I was fortunate to get off so easily because I have really never understood 
the Trinity. I've always struggled to get my arms around this idea. As a child, I was told there was one God in three persons, and that made absolutely no sense to me. I knew that one plus one plus one does not equal one. As an adult, I turned to our Book of Confessions, and, and uh, the Book of Confessions is, is, is this record we Presbyterians have of the wisdom and understanding of previous generations. And I looked at the second Helvetic Confession, which it was written in the 16th century, and it had this to say about the Trinity. Quote, there are not three gods, but three persons, consubstantial, co-eternal, and co-equal, distinct with respect to hypostases and with respect to order, the one preceding the other yet without any inequality, end quote. Well, that clears everything up, doesn't it? Belief in the Trinity is a core confession of the Christian tradition. So I really do sincerely continue to work on better understanding it. And the, and the thing that's probably helped me the most is understanding and learning about the context in which this doctrine was crafted. Trinitarian thinking was actually quite late. Um, it developed in the fourth century. Uh, the, the text that, that for this morning, those are really the only times that the doctrine is explicitly referenced in the biblical text. Um, so so we, we go forward to the fourth century, and, and this was just this really interesting time in the history of Christian thought. Great debates raged about the nature and the character of God. The, the hottest discussions revolved around the relationship between Jesus and God. Was Jesus subordinate to God? Were they equal? Uh, if so, in what way? Were God and Jesus of the same substance? Now, the, there were mass demonstrations in favor of one position over another. People marched in the streets, carrying placards and chanting slogans. These folks asked the question, who is God? And then they came up with answers that they passionately promoted and defended. Now these days we are content to say, well, the true nature of God is a mystery. And then we go back to talking about the weather or sports. But the fact is there are people out there in the world hungry to hear and understand about God. So it's good for us to be able to talk about God with as much coherence as we possibly can. So that's why this Trinity Sunday is important. It's a day when we ask and try to answer the question, who is God? Now, the doctrine of the Trinity is one way of answering that question, but there are others. And I wanna focus on another way of talking about God. And it's one that's more rooted in the biblical text itself. The Bible is this lengthy book that's all about God. Um, but there, the Bible is short on abstract definitions of God because it's so busy telling us what God has done. And here I'm gonna make use of Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann. And he um, pulls out from the text um, and lets us know that the earliest testimony about God consisted of sentences in which God was the subject. And the Bible is full of such sentences. God created the earth. God redeemed Israel. God fed the people in the wilderness. God loved Israel as a parent loves a child. Now in the Psalms, those sentences become more personal. God delivers me from my enemies. God has known me and loved me since before I was born. God gives me what I need for each day. And then in the New Testament, Jesus becomes the subject of such sentences. Jesus heals the sick. Jesus commands us to love one another. Jesus offers new life. Jesus redeems all of creation. The Bible asks the question, who is God? And answers it by telling us what God has done using sentences in which God is the subject. Now, 
that probably just seems so obvious. Um, yet think about how most of our sentences begin with the word I. I need, I want, I think, I believe, I love, I create. In one of his short stories, Garrison Keillor writes about a teacher named uh, Corrine who arrives at her parents' home during Christmas break, uh, the back seat of her VW filled with 132 essays by her 17-year-old students on Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken, all in need of grading. Keeler writes, quote, 132 essays of 500 words each, about 70,000 words about the poem, Two Roads Diverged in a Yellow Wood, and of those words, at least 10,000 were I, me, or mine. This poem makes me think of what happened to me when I was 10 and my parents said to me, for them, all roads converged into the first person singular, end quote. In a world dominated by the first person singular, it is a countercultural act to construct sentences in which God is the subject. I decided to give it a try. Here are a few of the sentences I came up with. God loves me. God invites me to love other people. God surprises me. God promises to be with me always. God carries me. God saves me from my deepest fears. God showers me with gifts. God gives me the strength to do things I could not do without God. It was surprisingly difficult beginning each sentence with God. I'm not used to it. I'm used to beginning my sentences with I. See, I just did it again. Because most days, everything is about me. Success, well, that's due to my hard work and skills. Failure, didn't work hard enough. Skills must be getting rusty or a bit obsolete. Either way, it's all about me. That's why when, when I am in my car, I, I, I tend to take the behavior of the other drivers personally. I'm convinced that on mornings when I'm running late, somehow this information gets out to the other drivers via, oh, I don't know, some secret radio waves. And, and then the other drivers purposely slow down. They purposely cut me off, all part of a vast conspiracy to make me even later. On such mornings, it really doesn't cross my mind that the traffic pattern is not all about me. The best cure for that kind of relentless self-focus, making God the subject, the main author, the central actor, the focus of our thoughts and actions. That's what we do when we worship. We gather and make God the subject of our conversation. Worship is the best reminder I know that I am not the center of the universe. But it's just one hour out of many in a given week. The trick is trying to do that the rest of the time. Now, the doctrine of the Trinity may help you do that. And if so, that's awesome. But the important thing is that we, like our fourth century counterparts, spend a little time and energy focusing on God, making God the subject of our inquiry. And in doing so, we remind ourselves that the world revolves around God and not around any of us. We'd been stopped at the subway station for quite a long time when a voice came over the loudspeaker, this subway car is now out of service, please exit the car. So all of us that were on that sub subway, the, the different cars in that, in, in that particular train, we, we all got out grumbling, annoyed, frustrated. Um, and so then we were all standing bunched up on the platform. And, and then we noticed a man was pushing his way through the crowd. Excuse me, pardon me, have to get through, let me through. Um, and we tried to explain to this man that, that this, this subway um, train was, was out of service. But he didn't listen. Uh, he was an important person um, uh, with 
important things to do, important people to see. Um, so he pushed his way onto the then empty subway car. And I will never forget the look on his face as he turned around and realized that he was all alone on that subway car. I think that's what happens when we forget about God and we think that we are the center of the universe. We end up alone on a subway car heading nowhere. That's why we need to make God the subject of our sentences. And, and, and this isn't about grammar or sentence structure. This is the difference really between life and death. It's the difference between li living a, a disconnected, self-focused, uninteresting, lonely life and living the engaged, connected, abundant, meaning-filled life that God longs, wants for each one of us. So I would like to change the name of this day from Trinity Sunday to the Sunday when we do our very, very, very best to remember that God is the center of the universe. And of course, once a year, it is not often enough to do this good work. Every good day, every day is a good day to remember, to remember that truth. But if that doesn't happen too often, it really is okay. God will still be at work in our lives, loving us, claiming us, challenging us. God will still be at work in the world, redeeming, comforting, confronting, forgiving. Because that's what God does. That's who God is. Amen.
In response to Amy's sermon about the Trinity, I share my copy of a famous Byzantine icon. It's by Andrei Rublev, who lived in Moscow in the 14th century. For Orthodox Christians, icons make the invisible visible. They invite us, draw us into the realm of God. This icon is based on a story from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 18, when three visitors, messengers, when God visits Abraham and Sarah and tells them of the promise that they will have a son. They entertain these three visitors and feed them. So I invite you to look more closely at this gorgeous icon. The Father, the source of all, dressed in gold, whole and complete. The Son, dressed in blue, connecting sky and water, heaven and earth wearing red because the sun chose to suffer with a gold sash representing the victory of the resurrection and the Holy Spirit also dressed in blue covered in this gorgeous delicate green. The Spirit hovers over creation before the beginning of time. The Spirit is with us always. They're sitting around a table. They're all the same size. They all have a similar look. And the Spirit seems to be looking at this little box, this little outline of a rectangle. And it's Franciscan priest, Richard Rohr, who points to that box and says, perhaps years and years ago, there was a mirror there so that when an Orthodox Christian gazed upon this icon, they would join this circle around this table on a journey, the journey of life. Today we celebrate the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, known as Mother, Brother, Friend, experienced as wisdom, word, and life. Come, join the dance of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Trinity is a mystery. God is one. God is three. 
God is three in one. So come join the dance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Come join the dance of mother, brother, friend. Come join the dance of wisdom, word, and life. May the Holy Trinity bless you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen.